the, the thing that I've most enjoyed about archiving is that as soon as I got into the sector, I felt like I'd found my people a little bit. Learning to get the balance right between facilitating access to archives to researchers whilst also trying to manage risk. Hello there, I'm Sarah McCluskey and this is Research Adjacent. Each episode, I talk to amazing research adjacent professionals about what they do and why it makes a difference. Keep listening to find out why we think the research adjacent space is where the real magic happens. Hello there, it's Sarah here. For this episode, I have my first ever double header with not one but two guests, Susan Shanks and Alice Millard. Susan and Alice are both archivists, and although they are based at opposite ends of the country, with that being County Durham for Susan and West Sussex for Alice, they are working together on the New Jerusalem's New Towns Archives project. Thanks are due to Alina Congreve as well for introducing me to Alice and Susan when she rightly pointed out that archivists are yet another essential research-adjacent role that we don't hear enough about. Where would historians and other social history researchers be without them? Listen on to hear Alice and Susan telling us all about how they became archivists and what their work entails. Welcome along to the podcast, Alice and Susan. It is lovely to have you here and my first two guest podcasts, so we shall see how it goes. I wonder if, Susan, I could come to you first and you could tell us a little bit about what it is that you do. Okay, hello Sarah, it's lovely to be on here. So my name is Susan and I am an archivist. So I currently work as a cataloguing archivist at Durham County Record Office. And I don't know if you want me to explain exactly what an archivist does. I think that would probably be yeah helpful because I think most people listening have probably got some idea, you know, a vague sense of working in museums, but beyond that, perhaps not, not very clear idea. <laughs> Okay, well, um, I'll do my best to cover it, and then Alice hopefully can help me <laughs> if I if I undersell it or misrepresent anything. But basically, we look after essentially historic records, which are records have been that have been created as part of a process, lots of different types of processes, and we look after them to make sure that they are accessible to the public and researchers and we make sure that they are looked after. We almost act as stewards for the records for as long as we can keep them uh, keep them in a kind of accessible state for, if you see what I mean, or for as long as possible. So it's it's a very, very broad kind of career. I'm currently a local authority archivist. Mm -hmm. I think like you alluded to, you can get archivists to work in museums, they can work for private archives. Archives tend to be uh, as distinct, distinct from museums, they tend to be collections of records, documents, very generally speaking, as mm -hmm. opposed to museum where you might have collections of objects, uh, those kind of items. So that's kind of a very basic way of describing how we're distinct from museums. Yeah, thank you. So you're at, you're at a council. Alice, how does your job, how is your job similar or different to Susan? I think mine... It's almost exactly the same as Susan, to be honest. <laughs> I think she absolutely nailed it. And I don't really have to do much in terms of introducing myself. <laughs> so but I am also an archivist, project archivist at West Sussex Record Office, which is also, also a local authority archive. And my job is seems to be very, very similar to Susan's. Yeah. And so we've got you both on together today, because even though you're based in different parts of the country, you're c working together on a project. So would one of you like to tell us about that project? Uh, yes. Yes, we are both just two partners of several others dotted around England, Wales and the Republic of Ireland. We are part of the New Jerusalem's project, which is looking to make the archives of I think it's 11 new towns across these countries available to researchers for the first time. So um, at West Sussex Record Office myself I'm cataloguing the archives of the Crawley New Town mm -hmm. and uh, Susan you are? I'm recording sorry cataloguing the records of Peter Lee and Newton Acliffe which are two of the new towns in Durham. Yeah, and what sorts of materials and things have you got there that might be useful to people? Uh, well, for us, it's primarily a lot of minutes, mm -hmm. a lot of board papers, 
a lot of land records, lots of maps and plans and photographs, that kind of thing. And I'm not sure, I think Susan's probably dealing with the same kind of material. Yeah, pretty similar. A lot of the ones that Alice is describing, we had catalogued already, but there were certain elements of those collections that we hadn't catalogued. So um, masses of photographs we've given individual descriptions to relating to the new towns. And we also have a couple of like additional items, including the records of Victor Passmore, who is an artist who was heavily involved in the design of Peter Lee. Mm. A few other elements as well. So it's quite, I think, across all, I think it is 11 uh, organisations that are holding these records. There's quite a, there is quite a broad range. Mm. And the idea is to signpost, to, to make them available to researchers, anyone who wants to find out more about new towns. But mm. I think also within that process, highlight more about the existing collections that are mm -hmm. as well, that people might. So there's what we're working on and there's also the collections as a whole, if you see what I mean. Yeah. Yeah, and are there particular things you're hoping will come out of gathering together all these materials? Yeah, I think we're especially hearing more about developing new towns and new developments that are that mimic that sort of new town movement that happened mm -hmm. in the 40s, 50s and 60s. And so I think the idea is that getting all these partners together and either cataloguing afresh or revisiting or fleshing out descriptions of these records from that time period will allow people like urban planners and architects, sociologists, that kind of thing, a really good base to do research on and learn from that period of time. Yeah, sounds really interesting. Look forward to seeing what comes out of it. So, I mean, although both of you are doing similar roles, um, I, I, I'd be interested to hear whether you've had similar paths into them. Um, Susan, maybe you could tell us about your career journey and how you've ended up where you are now. Uh, yeah, definitely. I've been looking at my CV on LinkedIn and I'm like, oh, that's a weird path. <laughs> I'll write some of it down. So I'll try and truncate it a little bit so it's not too long. But <laughs> basically, <laughs> I started off, I did my degree in history and I left in uni in 2007 because and I thought I should get a job rather than doing anything else because it was 2007 and it was a bit hairy kind of financially mm -hmm. so I got a job working in like in fundraising and events I worked for a charity I worked for and I worked for a a, a big kind of national gallery in London mm -hmm. so doing kind of stewardship for major donors and that kind of thing in events management but crucially I also did database management which was like information management and I mm. found that brain worked really well with information management, more so than fundraising. I've met some amazing fundraisers. I am not a natural fundraiser. <laughs> I tell you. So I moved away from that. I had a kind of career change, did some volunteering because I thought archiving kind of combined that information management that I was doing with like all the donor databases and things like that. Mm -hmm. But it also heritage lilt to it as well, which has always been like my passion. So I volunteered for a few different archives in London and I worked part-time just doing an admin job while I was doing that and then I did a postgraduate diploma in archiving at UCL mm. which is one of the crucial at the minute anyway one of the crucial elements into getting into the profession is making sure that you have a professional qualification mm -hmm. something that's changing a bit now but and then from there, I worked for Lambeth Archives as an archivist, like kind of more generalised, working in the search room, uh, running the service that we had there. And then I moved, this is where it gets a bit like, <laughs> when I moved back up north, when I had my son, I had to kind of reframe it a bit. And I worked in information governance right. in North Yorkshire, which is kind of like the more records management side of archives. It's kind of working with what we sometimes refer to as live records. Mm -hmm in terms of looking after kind of data information that was currently being used by the council. And then I moved from there to Tyne and Weir, where I was sort of a digital archivist for a while, and then I'm mm -hmm. in Durham. Mm. So it's a bit it's a bit like, you know, around the houses, but I got here in the end. <laughs> As you say, lots of different roles in in managing different kinds of materials, managing and organising different kinds of materials. Yeah, interesting. Thanks, Susan. Alice, what was your journey like then? Um, it's been not been quite as around the house as season, <laughs> but, but then again, I did only leave university in 2015, mm -hmm. so different, different generation, I think. But 
So I did English literature at university. I had, I did have an interest in history, which a lot of people do when they go into archives, but not everybody. I wasn't very good at history at uh, school. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I did English literature, left, went into museums for a few years. So I did a few different roles there. I was sort of a learning assistant and helped with developing exhibitions and looking Mm -hmm. after collections within museums, so object-based. But then I was finding it quite tricky to progress in the museum sector. It's it's extremely competitive with a lot of very, very highly skilled people. So I, I chose to do a master's in the hopes that that would perhaps boost boost my career a little bit so I did a cultural heritage master's which is really really interesting but sadly didn't really help an awful lot so I moved into archives and I got a job working in the reading room at West Sussex Record Office where I work now and I've not left Mm. (laughs) so about two years into that role I did also did a postgraduate diploma but with Dundee and you can do that um, part time and by distance learning. So that was really useful for me. So I could work at the same time. Mm-hmm. And this current role with the New Jerusalem's project is my first office job. Mm-hmm. Excellent. So you've said you've yeah you both said there you did you did this postgraduate diploma in archives. So is it very much you know that's almost like a formal entry requirement for archive work? Yeah. So um, you do have to have a postgraduate qualification. There's a governing body called the Archives and Records Association, and they accredit a few different courses around the country. Mm-hmm. And so there are that you can either do a diploma or you can do a full master's. With the difference is the dissertation. Yeah. Okay. Um, and that will allow you to qualify. Oh, interesting. And is it, you you mentioned there, Alice, about the museum's world being very competitive, and certainly I've done a little bit of work around museums never directly worked for them myself and certainly that's that's what I've heard as well is the archive world as competitive or a little bit less so I think it's still quite competitive I think Susan would probably agree with me but (laughs) I don't think it's quite quite as competitive in my experience as the Mm -hmm. museum sector I think that's probably I I do agree sorry Sarah to interrupt no no go ahead no I mean it's it's an interesting one. I think partly the problem with archives is, and this is probably true of museums as well, is that there aren't that many archivists, but in the country as a whole, you know, comparative to some other professions. But the number of jobs available, particularly if you're not in the South, I think is probably mm-hmm. generally, I mean, may even be a problem in the South as well. But I remember in London, there being a lot of jobs available, but mm-hmm. back up, like for example, here in the Northeast and, and the North in general, I feel like it sort of, I think one of the things is people, unless it's a project job, mm-hmm. generally speak, people tend to stay in permanent jobs for quite a long mm. time. So that's a, it's kind of, it's not, a, it's not a bad thing. It just means that because there aren't that many jobs, it means that that kind of, the competition, I think, for permanent roles is could be particularly difficult. But then project roles, I think, I'm right in say, Alice, there might be a bit more like movement in, but that doesn't mean that you kind of move up, if you see what I mean. Yeah. But it's, but it's like, there are definitely different opportunities for you to do different mm. things, particularly if you're able to move around the country, I think mm-hmm. that's probably worth saying. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah. And that's really interesting. And are there, with you saying, Susan, there's, there seems to be lots more jobs kind of in London or the South. Is that because important collections are held in the South of England or is it just, there's it's more populated? You know what I mean? So there's more jobs, do you think? <laughs> Oh, that's a really difficult question to ask. <laughs> I don't know if I want to put my head across the platform of the power of it. Of course, there are, there are really massively important collections in London. And there's a huge pop. It's both, really. It's both yeah. as as a population there as well. But I mean, to say that there aren't important collections elsewhere in the country, I think is incorrect and unfair. But I think that the opportunities for funding possibly have been, you know, there's been less of that in other parts of the country I want to say but it's not I don't mean that like it should be a competition I think it's more like I think something it's just a fact of life at the minute and it does but it does mean that community collections or important collections that may not have been seen as traditionally important Mm -hmm. get sometimes 
and yeah i think i think that's part of it but i don't i wouldn't want to go into it no no that's okay that's okay i completely appreciate that and um, no it's just interesting question just because some work i've done in the in the past being based up in the northeast as well myself there is undoubtedly a bias in funding to what they call the golden triangle which is london cambridge oxford and they they get a disproportionate amount of funding for everything and i just was interested to hear if that was the case in in archives as well but if you don't know that that's completely fine that's okay <laughs> it's more of a suspicion like the kind of yeah. planning on any any research that i've got to back myself but <laughs> that's anecdotal i think that's that's totally fine totally fine so one thing something i like to ask my guests about is um or in that journey that they've had to get to where they are today i'm maybe picking out a couple of kind of highs and lows things that have been really good and things that have been challenging so maybe i'll come to each of you in turn to answer that question alice could i come to you first you maybe tell us about you know a career high and a career low perhaps oh okay Hmm. I think I can definitely give you a high. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> I, I, so we've been doing quite a bit of intersectionality work mm-hmm. at the Western City Record Office. And as part of that, I began trying to search for people of non-white heritage in our parish registers. And if you don't know what they are, they're basically they were registers kept by local vicars over the last few hundred years and recording baptism marriages and burials Mm -hmm. and so from that I was able to do quite a bit of research into people of non-white heritage so black Caribbean South Asian heritage and that was really really fruitful and that attracted a lot of lovely conversations with the public who had also done similar work and it was just it was really nice and from that I was also able to go down a massive tangent and actually was able to identify a young black boy in a painting by Sir Joshua Reynolds mm. and that's held by Yale University and that was most definitely a high. Oh fantastic and is that painting like is that something that we could get a link and uh, you know share in the show notes people could go and have a look at that? Absolutely yeah definitely. Yeah fantastic that must have been really interesting because I think there is this sort of misconception that people from other heritage other backgrounds coming to the UK is quite a, a recent thing but of course it's not is it it's something that's Most definitely not the earliest yeah. entry I found in the parish registers was 1500s so good, yeah, yeah yeah so no I think as long it's something that's just almost in the human psyche isn't it as soon as we can some people just have that that wanderlust to to get out and explore the world so yeah fantastic and maybe then maybe to frame it rather than thinking about career life career low but perhaps something that you've found challenging as you've gone through your career I yeah I think I think for me learning to get the balance right between allowing sort of like facilitating access to archives for researchers and then whilst also trying to manage risk with sort of things like data protection and mm-hmm just protecting documents full stop i mean yeah. there's lots of preventative things we have to to be concerned about to make sure things actually last yeah at the test of time so actually i think i know that's <laughs> it's quite wishy-washy but uh, i think that's a really kind of hard thing to do and i don't think anyone stops trying to manage that across their career yeah imagine at times it must lead to difficult conversations you know there's a resource that somebody really wants access to but but it's just not possible for whatever reason yeah it's it's it is a tricky thing and sometimes there are delays that have to be in place for various reasons closure periods i know with the the current project the role that i'm doing i'm having the same sort of like debates within myself with with what i need to put a stop on for a little while to make sure that our conservator can make sure it's in good enough condition to to access but that will inevitably come with it some tricky conversations about asking people to wait just a, a wee bit longer yeah yeah <laughs> managing expectations always a challenge yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you and uh, susan maybe i could come to you with the the same question so something that you're really proud of but then maybe something that's also been a bit challenging 
Yeah, something that I was really proud of. I've just been trying to think back. Uh, I'm really proud of the work I've done on this particular project. Mm -hmm. Writing descriptions for images it isn't the mo always the most, it's a bit of a thankless task sometimes. <laughs> but even since we've been doing it, we've had a couple of local projects using those images and being able to find things easier in, in an easier fashion than, you know, than previously, which yeah. I'm quite proud of been part of a few exhibitions and it hasn't necessarily required them to be absolutely you know au fait with how to use a catalogue and stuff yeah. like that like you can just search for the name of a street and it might come up that's mm -hmm. quite satisfying i've always been that had a bit more balance on like wanting people to be able to access things rather than cataloguing perfectly although you have to fight again like balance was saying like everything with archives you have to find that balance yeah between between certain things um I mean, to be honest as well, the, the thing that I've most enjoyed about archiving is that as soon as I got into the sector, I felt like I'd found my people a little bit in mm. terms of how people worked and like wherever I've worked as an archivist, I've always found people to be lovely, collaborative, really open to suggestions and respectful, that kind of thing. So, and I think because everyone likes managing information, which is slightly nerdy, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know whether you feel the same, Alice, but like I've always felt very welcomed in the in the archive world, if you like, whether people, you know, whatever kind of archive people are working for. Yeah. Um, nice to find your people. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and I think in terms of lows or challenges, yeah, it's it's a tricky one. I found when it comes to it, I think what I've learned so far is that unless you are a project archivist, which is what Alice and I both are at the minute, working on something specific where you are meant to be cataloguing, it's very different, difficult to kind of actually get your hands on archives and do some mm. cataloging if you work in a kind of service delivery role. Like I was when I was at Lambeth, you're an archivist, you're meant to be doing cataloging, but you're also, but you're also kind of presenting the archives to people who are visiting and that kind of thing. And there's a lot of kind of administrative work that comes with that. And I, I actually get a lot from that kind of work. I'm not saying kind of one is better than the other, but when you're kind of doing the archive course, sometimes the impression you get is that you'll be cataloging all day, you'll be getting really deep into the archives. And it's kind of just a slightly different, you do have to balance that kind of understanding of how much you're actually going to be able to get done from that with that archivist, pure archivist hat on, than yeah. with the kind of service delivery. And I love um, service delivery. I'm working with the public. It's one of the best things about archiving is that you get to show people what, you, what you've what you worked on and, and what is their heritage as well, mm -hmm. like stories from their communities and things like that. Um, but it's, it's difficult to balance that with that kind of background of really kind of core work that we just I think we're generally archives are quite under resourced in that respect unless you've been funded for a project that's that's quite a challenge sometimes yeah it sounds like it be that sense of doing the work versus kind of sharing the work with other people that I think a lot of people who listen to this pro this podcast in various different roles will really relate to that yeah yeah oh well thank you both for that um Another question that I, I always like to ask my guests uh, is, if you had a magic wand, what would you change about the world that you work in? So you certainly both touched on things which, which perhaps cause frustrations. Maybe, maybe it's those, but maybe there's something else completely. Um, Alice, could I come to you first? Yeah, I did have a little think about this because it, yeah, because there is something that, that I would if I had sort of unlimited money. <laughs> yeah. I would so it's kind of still sort of almost like the opposite of so because Susan and I do this project and it's it's part of quite a very large national project and that's mm -hmm. fantastic and I think it takes these these projects and these big pots of money to make these things happen in archives and I think that's brilliant but it would be fan even better if we if we had unlimited funds to tackle what I call sort of like the bread and butter stuff in in the archives so I think for me in my experience at the local authority record office we have quite a large backlog of records mm -hmm. and many many archives have the same thing so legacy things that haven't quite yet been catalogued and made as accessible as we would like them to be again it's just an issue with resources yeah I think lots of places have it in museums across the heritage sector it's not it's not uncommon but I think if we, if we did have unlimited money and if I could wave a magic wand, I would make sure that every archive had enough resources to tackle their, the things that are waiting perhaps further down the priority list. 
Yeah, tackle that backlog. That sounds like an excellent use of your magic wand. Susan, what? <laughs> yeah, Susan, what would you do? Oh, Alice, that, yeah. <laughs> My <laughs> way behind that one as well. <laughs> but I do, I do have another one, uh, which, well, it sounds a bit um, dry after Alice's one, but like, I'd love to be able for every single archive across the country to have a sustainable digital repository, hmm. which which is basically to do with the transfer over from the conservation of paper records to the conservation of what we call born digital records. Right. So records that have been created since the digital age began. Right. Okay. Like, yeah. Like, you might have a computer, like you might have a Word document, that kind of thing. Yeah. Is one of the things that we're looking at as a sector is our future, of course, and part of that future is going to be and a lot of the, a lot of work is underway doing this kind of preparing archivists to become digital archivists mm -hmm. or digital archives being the norm and what a lot of local authorities a lot of organizations lack is the ability to fund digital repositories like permanently it's not like yeah. having an archive store which comes with its own problems but it's like having somewhere to retain those records so those digital records for posterity in the same way that you would and in a in a in a kind of just a normal physical store and i think one of the major obstructions to that is not knowing necessarily where funding is coming from in the future yeah. because if you because digital repositories are expensive um, yeah and it's it sounds I'm, I'm sorry if it sounds a bit boring but it's kind of one of the things that as a profession is a major challenge that i think everyone faces on it. I can imagine as well something that must be a huge challenge thinking about digital resources is the fact that, you know, if we're thinking 100 years ago, yeah, only maybe there's only a handful of documents or photographs or something. But now just the sheer volume of material that's available and sorting through it and deciding what's worthy of keeping and all that sort of stuff just must be an enormous task. I think it is. And I think there are a lot of good people working on it. I think it's just that when it comes down to kind of individual organisations or local authorities and things like mm -hmm. that, I guess I just want that focus to be able to be spread to those. I mean, I'm, I'm sure it is already kind of underway in a lot of local authorities as well. It's just that, that idea of like knowing what's going to happen to them. You know, there are some things from the 90s that can't be accessed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That long ago. No. Like, if you imagine opening an old file, and not a computer of yours, and being like, "Oh no, it's Word 2003." Or something. <laughs> yeah, like, can't do it. It's, it. This is a massive simplification of amazing work that lots of people, like the Digital Preservation Coalition, are doing. But like, it's it's to me, it's always been at the back of my mind as something interesting and a, a place to get into. And it's yeah. the future of the so we have to do something about it. Oh, is it? You're giving you're giving me flashbacks to trying to go to look at to find a photograph from my PhD and not being able to get into the files because it was some old version of Word. So yes, <laughs> excellent. Oh, uh, thank you both so much. Um, I think we should think about wrapping up our conversation now. But just to give you the opportunity to share where people can find you if they'd either like to find out more about you or what you're working on um alice where's the best place for people to track you down uh yeah so you can contact the email address of west sussex record office if you just mm -hmm. give them a quick google you'll find their contact details there and do you hang out on linkedin or any social media or are you i'm afraid not no <laughs> that's <laughs> probably very sensible and Susan, where could people track you down? Um, I think LinkedIn is probably the best one for me at the minute. Great. Okay. Well, we can get links to both of those as well and put them in the show notes. So, well, it just remains to say thank you so much for taking the time to come along and have a chat. I've certainly learned a lot and thought about things I haven't thought about in a long time. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks for listening to Research Adjacent. If you're listening in a podcast app, please check you're subscribed and then use the links under the episode to find full show notes and to follow the podcast on LinkedIn, Twitter or Instagram. Also, make sure that you're subscribed to the Research Adjacent Roundup newsletter. You can also find all the links and other episodes at www.researchadjacent.com. Research Adjacent is presented and produced by Sarah McCluskey and you, yes you, get a big gold star for listening right to the end. See you next time.